and verse number 24. 2 Kings chapter 17 and verse number 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and some Hepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Father, bless this holy word now. Thy name I pray, man. All right, now what I'm going to do tonight is try to give you just a little historical narrative to bring you up to date with what's going on here in 2 Kings chapter number 17. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam was the successor to the throne, and there was a problem in the country. There was a division among the people. They didn't follow Solomon like they did David. And so when, uh, when Rehoboam became the king, uh, a lot of them rebelled against him, and they met and had a meeting. In the meeting, they wanted to know what kind of king he'd be. So they asked counsel of the uh, old men, and the old men says, if you'll walk before them, be a king, take care of your people, do what you need to do, they'll follow you. He asked the young men, and they said, as your father's hand was hard on them or strong against them, make yours even harder or stronger. And so he listened to the counsel of the younger, and because of that, there was a split. Ten of the tribes uh, seceded, so to please, and went to the north, and two, Benjamin and Judah, stayed in the south. Got so bad in the northern tribes that they had their own priesthood. And the reason for that is because they didn't want them coming to Jerusalem, to the priesthood, to the real temple of God, and worship the Lord. So they set themselves up, the Bible said, priests of the basest of men. Well, this schism continued, and they had civil war time and time and time again. The north against the south, the south against the north, in the kingdom. Eventually, in 722 B.C., the northern ten tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity. And they left just a handful of people in the land, I guess just to keep it from going completely uh, bad, you know. I had some, some people there to tell it. But what you're going to read here in 2 Kings chapter number 17 is how that the king of Assyria brought Babylonians. He brought all other types of, uh, of, of, of people and Assyrians, and he brought them, and he, he brought them into the land. If you'll notice in verse number 24, the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, from Kutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim. In other words, he brought all these different people from different places and populated the northern area. Now, they really can't be called the northern tribes from that moment on because they really weren't what you would call the tribes of Israel. What we have here is the foundation of what's called a Samaritan. And the Samaritans' existence is quite an enigma, but they definitely, to this very day, they exist. All you have to do is just a little research, get on the internet, and you'll find the Samaritans are observing their Passover, their uh, Feast of Tabernacles, and all the rest of that. And there are many among the, the Samaritans that say that they are the true Israel of God, that they are Ben Israel. So we have a lot of contention going on between the Samaritans and the Jews. Also, of course, if you don't know this, you have the British, Israelis, British Israelites who claim to be the ten northern tribes and the true Israel of God. And there may be others for that matter when you get into it. But the bottom line is there's a lot of bad blood now. A lot of bad blood. And when uh, Nehemiah came back into the land to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem... Sanballat and Tobiah and Gershom the Arabian and others wanted to join up with them. These were the northern people. They wanted to join with them. And uh, Nehemiah wouldn't let them do it. And here's what it says in the Bible. He says to them, Ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So he let them understand that they were not part of their people. And so the hatred and the animosity continued. They tried their best to stop it. These people, Gershom, and you, I know you've read your Bible, uh, uh, the Arabian and, and Sanballat and Tobiah, they tried to stop them, and for a while they did. But the work continued on, and the walls were built. 
The temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and Ezra reestablished the priesthood. And so Israel once again now has, a, uh, has an identity in the Holy Land. But now carry this over into the New Testament period of time because we're talking hundreds of years before Christ. Carry this hatred and this animosity over into the New Testament and then turn to Matthew chapter number 10 and verse 5. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 5. If you notice in verse number 1 in Matthew 10, it says, He called to him his disciples, 12 of them, and gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And if you notice, the list follows. It gives the names of all them that had been given this power. And it's an enigma, folks, that Judas Iscariot's name shows up here, but he's in the list. But anyway, in verse number 5, here's what the Lord told his disciples. He said, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. Now that's plain. You have a lot of fellows out there that are preaching and teaching and they say the Bible plainly says, sure it said, plainly says a lot of things. And it plainly said that. So what do you do preacher? Well, you have to rightly divide the word. You have to understand who's he talking to when did he say it? What period of time does it cover? Is it prophetic or is it historical or is it simply a doctrinal statement? What's going on with it? To rightly divide the word of truth. Now, if you can get these things nailed down and just get the beginning of them, folks, it'll open up the New Testament for you. And if you open up the New Testament, you'll open up the Bible. Yes, you will. You'll open up the Scripture. And once the Bible really starts opening up for you, it becomes a very interesting book. Because then what's going to happen to you, you're going to listen to an awful lot of people out here. And it's sad to say this, but so much preaching is only what the preacher's preaching, what he heard another preacher say. And, or his, uh, his, his little click, this is, uh, this is what they believe. Like the guy that called up one of the big gurus, said, Brother so-and-so, what do we believe? <laughs> That's, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that goes on. I'm serious. This is what goes on. They dare not say anything to rock the boat because of their denominational gurus and Hamans and so forth. So I want you to take your Bible and go to uh, John chapter number 4 and verse number 4. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. Now in John chapter number 4 and verse number 4, he says, he must needs go through Samaria. Now, is this a contradiction? No, it's passage of time. It's a different period of time. Remember I mentioned to you the other day that Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews are transitional books. If you spend all your time in Matthew, you're going to get messed up. If you spend all your time in Acts, you're going to get messed up. And if you spend all your time in Hebrews, you're going to get messed up. The book of Matthew is a transition from the Old Testament to the Jewish kingdom, the offer of the kingdom, the offer of the king. The law and the prophets are until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. John the Baptist, he was the one who was the forerunner, all right? That's Matthew. Then in the book of Acts, they'll come along and say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's what it plainly says. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Here's the problem. That is quoted from a period in the New Testament when the preaching of the gospel had not reached the complete gospel, had not reached out to the ends of the disciples and those that believed. They only had a partial understanding. They had the preaching of John the Baptist. Was that wrong? Absolutely not wrong. Absolutely. John the Baptist preached the truth as the truth was when he preached it. But there was more development to the truth after John the Baptist, you see. But that's how you understand the Bible. So don't let someone come along and tell you, ask you this question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Just pity them because they're spending all their time in the book of Acts and don't have a clue what the real age of grace is all about. You can't be born again without the Holy Spirit. But then that brings us to the Gospel of John and also the, and also the book of Hebrews. The church is going to be caught out of here, folks. It's going to be catch, caught up to meet Christ in the air 
It's called, it's the mystery. God said, 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul said in 1551, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's the rapture. That's a mystery. That wasn't revealed. All right. But when we are caught out of here, the focus then goes right back to the Jew again. Because church is not here. So the book of Hebrews is the book of Hebrews, you see, directed toward the Jew. And it is a transition from the age of grace into the Jewish kingdom once again, or the millennium, when the Jews become the head of all the nations. It's important if you get a hold of that, that Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews are transitional books. And there are many things that happen in the Bible that are transitional. They were true for the time, but it moved on. And there's more truth to be found later. And this is exactly what we find. The Lord said, if he smites you on one cheek, turn the other. Does the Bible plainly say that? Yes, it does. But it also plainly says, go by a sword. Yes, it does. You have to find the context of what it's talking about. And you know, these are good people. I'm up here to, this, tonight to run people. Many, many people in your own family probably, uh, you know, see things in a completely different light. But this opened up the Bible for me. And so what we have now is the scripture telling us that these Samaritans were hated and despised by the Jew. And the first thing that Christ does in the Gospel of John, after he talks to Nicodemus in John 3, he talks to a Samaritan woman. And he must, know, must needs go out of his way to go there. Normally when the Jews travel from the north to the south or the, or, the, or the south to the north, they would go up through what's called the Jordan Rift. The Jordan Rift is where the Jordan River flows from Mount Hermon in the north all the way to the Dead Sea. They would cross over to the eastern side of the Jordan, go up the rift, and then cross back over the Jordan once they had gotten by Samaria. They wouldn't go through it. They wouldn't walk through it. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm going into Samaria. Of course, it begs the question tonight, and I'm, I'm sure you've thought of this, why just this one woman? Because have you read the context of John chapter number four? Come see a man that has told me all things that I've ever done. She was a witness. She was preaching a testimony for him. But the men did not believe her. Said, we believe not because of you. You read that. That's plain as it can be. In other words, we don't accept your testimony. You're a piece of low life trash. We're going to hear him ourselves. And so over and over again, the Samaritans are mentioned in the New Testament. Probably 99% of the people out here in the world have heard of the Good Samaritan. Don't you think? You hear it every day practically on the news. The Good Samaritan. But I wonder how many of them have any idea what the context is and what a Samaritan is. See? They, I doubt if they do. Uh, but uh, it's, just like the, it's just like the ones out there who say, Hallelujah! They have no idea. That's pure Hebrew. And that means praise Jehovah. That's what it means. Hallelujah. Jehovah. <clears throat> There's a lot of things like that. God has, I think God has a sense of humor, to tell you the truth, bud. He says, you may not believe the Bible, but I'm going to have you quoting the Bible every time you turn around. <laughs> and they are. They quote the scripture. So in John chapter number four, he said, I must needs go through Samaria. And I haven't answered the question, but I'll ask this question when you take it home with you tonight. Why just her? See, why just the woman? Well, for one thing, doctrinally, and in the position of the scripture, he's opening the door to Samaria. In plain words, he's making it very clear. The gospel of John is about he that believeth. It's not about the Jewish kingdom. There's nothing in here about the kingdom of heaven. None of that's in here. See, so if you're not going to be preaching the Jewish kingdom of heaven, then you're going to reach out to the ends of the earth. You're going to bring in Jew and Gentile. You're going to bring in Samaritan and Jew makes no difference whatsoever for the foot of the cross is level and indiscriminate and anybody can come whosoever will let him come and take of the water of life freely there's another lesson to learn about them look at Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 33 Luke 10 33 there was a certain Samaritan as he journeyed he came where he was and when he saw him he had compassion on him and then he went and to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
Now, you know, there's nothing any more gracious than what this man did. He did this for a Jew. Uh, the Jew was on his way to Jericho and he fell among thieves. Uh, Jericho is the city of the curse and he was going down to the city of the curse because Jericho is cursed. He went down to the city of the curse. If, who was it that got saved in Jericho? You remember the one who was up in a sycamore tree? That's right, Zacchaeus. And who was it sitting by the roadside begging and he was in Jericho? Blind Bartimaeus. When these things happen, there's lessons in them. A lot of them, a lot of them pre figure something that's much bigger than that individual. It's just like the Samaritan here, okay? What he's saying is that the Jews, the children that have the gospel of the kingdom, they've got, they have the privilege, they have the oracles of God, they've got all these things, they squander them. They don't appreciate the value of what they have. But those outside the camp, like the Syrophoenician woman or like the Roman and so forth, they treasure when they hear something like that. Do you remember what he said to the people? He said, he said, if the mighty works had been done in Sodom, that's been done among you, they would have what? They would have long since repented. All right. All right, now that's, that's what's called omniscience. In plain words, that's God knowing everything. Okay? But then again, that begs another question. <laughs> I want to fill you full of questions tonight. If he knew that they would repent if they got the gospel, how come they didn't get it? It's church mouse time. Quiet. That's what the Bible's about, folks. It's about making you think. Well, say, so what's going on, preacher? The judge of the whole earth will do right. That's what's going on. So if you look at in Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 33, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. So I'm, I've, there's no greater act of compassion in the whole Bible than this Samaritan. And he, you know, some say he's half-breed Jew. He might have been half-breed. He might have been less than that. He could have been Babylonian and Assyrian and all the rest of them, a, a, a mixture, a hybrid, <laughs> a real hybrid. Who knows? But that's not what's important. What's important is his heart. You see, he had the heart. And this is what the tension, this is what's calling your attention to. For example, this one, Luke chapter 17, verse number 16. Luke 17, 16. If you notice what it says, verse 11, it came to pass, he went to Jerusalem, passed through the midst of Samaria, and entered into a certain village, met him ten men that were lepers, verse 12. They lifted up their voice, said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. All right, now one of them really couldn't go to the priest. You know why? He was a Samaritan. He would not have been allowed to the place that the Jew had. But look what he did. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Fell on his face, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, now note carefully, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? In other words, I told you to go to the priest, but once you realized what had been done to you, you should have stopped in your tracks and come right back to me and fell down before me and thanked me for what I did. This is one of the things that's plaguing the church today. We got pulpits full of preachers that won't thank you for anything. Amen. Unthankful, unholy. Uh, amen. You take for granted. God's been good to me. I thank him all the time. All the time. Um, thank you tonight. People gave me cards at Christmas time. They gave us a lot of cards. I want to thank you tonight for what you did, and I'm going to thank them again this coming Sunday. I appreciate stuff that's done for me. I really do. I told you about the man that took us to the to the uh, to the to the hotel out there on Chapman Highway. I was so nervous I couldn't even eat the ice cream they had for me. I was a I was a very backward child, very 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 shy and very backward. And, uh, and when somebody did something for me, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it when somebody does something. He fell down and worshipped him. Here's the point. The children of the kingdom that had so much privilege, they didn't. They didn't. Why? They should have. 
You see, genealogy and being born into the right family and the right crowd doesn't make you spiritual or what you ought to be. Amen. Give not that which is holy to the dogs. Cast not your pearls before swine. Who called them swine and dogs? Who did? <laughs> I didn't. And the apostle Peter, when he quotes that, he says, the dog returns to his vomit again, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. It's happened to them according to the true proverb. It had been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You live your own life, dear friend. Don't compare yourself with a bunch of Baptists. Don't compare yourself with anybody. Comparing themselves with themselves, they're not wise. That may be one of the reasons they're not dragging you down is because you're looking at people too much. He judges us as individuals. Has God been good to you? Thank him for it. God save you, glorify his holy name. Amen. Let God know what you think. He, does, he appreciates this when somebody comes back and thanks him. Just like the woman I told you the other day that washed his feet with tears. The disciples, uh, the disciples, he washed the disciples' feet with water. Remember? She washed his feet with tears. And she never, doesn't say a word. Her name is not mentioned. And I will tell you something. I honestly believe it tonight with all my heart. She wasn't a fundamental Baptist either. Amen. She was a Christian. She loved Christ. Now, I wish I could get people to do that. I wish I could get you to love the Lord Jesus first and then make your choice about where you're going to go to church. Not being led by the Holy Ghost. Find a church that glorifies the Son of God. It doesn't glorify the preacher and it doesn't glorify the ministry and it doesn't glorify all the buildings they built. It glorifies God. Amen. So the, Sir, the Samaritan... And the, uh, the, the, the one that was healed was a Samaritan. And they, he turned back to God. He uses these type of people to teach great lessons. Now look at John 8, 33. John chapter number 8 and verse number 33. John 8, 33. We start reading verse number 31. said, Jesus to the Jews believed on him. If you continue in my word... Then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now watch their answer. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? See, they didn't see any need whatsoever in what he was talking about. They couldn't understand it. Now look what he says to them in John chapter number 8 and verse number 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he's a liar, and the father of it. The Lord Jesus told him, he said, I know you're the physical seed of Abraham. I know you are. But if that's all you are, you don't have anything. You better have more than the, being the physical seed of Abraham. What do you mean? You need to have the spirit of Abraham. If you want to be Abraham's children, you're going to believe like Abraham believed. He was the father of the faithful. You see how people latch on to something and they build a whole life around it? And it's as dead and empty as it can be. Amen. If you were Abraham's children, really... Children of faith of Abraham, he said, you'd have believed on me. Now, notice what he says here as he closes out this chapter. I want you to look over here in chapter number 8. In verse number 54. John eight fifty four. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. 56. Your father Abraham. See here? He says he's their father, but we're looking at the physical seed. 
Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Man. <laughs> Boy, this fellow must be deluded. They're thinking. Look at 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? He made Abraham. <laughs> Look what he said in verse number 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, the great I am. I am. I am. I remember a pastor told me a long time ago, he said, that scripture, a woman looked at that scripture and she said, that's bad grammar. <laughs> she said, how in the world could he say I am? Because he is the everlasting, eternal, existing one. From everlasting to everlasting, he is the great I am. Amen. And he said, Moses, when they want to know who sent you, you tell them, I am hath sent you. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, uh, these things are written in John that you might believe. Here's the part now. You remember I told you that Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews are transitional books. And then I've also mentioned to you many times before about the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All right, now this is an arbitrary designation. This is something that's been given. There's no, not a word in the Bible about a synoptic gospel. They just classify the three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as synoptic because of the English word synopsis, which simply means one view. Okay, so they're, they're saying Matthew, Mark, and Luke have uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have one view. Then they kick out John because John is different. It's entirely different. John talks about the same Lord Jesus Christ, but sets him in an entirely different context. The Gospel of John puts him as the Lamb of God. John 9, who healed me? Dost thou believe on the Son of God? The blind man said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? Do you remember that? John 9, Son of God, Son of God. Did you know that they're teaching young men when they go into a Bible colleges today, they'll teach some young fellow. They'll say, nowhere in the Bible does the Lord Jesus ever claim to be the Son of God. That he's that because they tell him he is, my Lord and my God, as Thomas said. Well, wait a minute, it says it in John 9. Yes, it does. But you see, when you get into manuscript evidence and you get into some of these new translations, they change that entirely. Well, because they don't like this. The blind man who represents Israel's blindness is told to wash in the pool of Siloam when the cursed earth is put upon his eyes to show the curse upon the eyes of the Jew. And the water of the pool of Siloam, the scent water, washes that away and they come seeing. Now they can see. I was blind, now I see. Here's the blind man, John chapter number 9. Who is the Son of God that I might believe? I that speak to thee am he. The point is, it's not about you being a Jew. It's not about Israel. It's about my identity as the Son of the living God. That's what John pushes. That's what he projects to people. And that's what he wants you to believe. And that's the last gospel ever written was the gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written. And their time had already passed, and the kingdom had already passed, and now we're moving into the church age. So this is why the third chapter of John, if you notice the first thing, what's the first miracle in the Gospel of John? Anybody remember? That's it. Water. Water to wine. All right. A wedding. Okay. You don't put new wine in old skins. Okay. New wine and old skins, the skins bust, can't contain it. That new wine must be contained within itself because that new wine is a representation of new theology. Something new added, okay? Not changing the truth, it's just a further revelation of it. All right, what happens third chapter then? The third chapter of the Gospel of John. Somebody gets saved. Nicodemus, what's he tell Nicodemus in John 3? You must be born again. 
Exactly. You must be born again, Nicodemus. So there we are. Lays the very foundation of the new birth, which is absolutely, folks, don't ever let anybody say to you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? That's, that's pitiful. It is. It's pitiful to say that to somebody. If you have not the Holy Spirit of God, you're none of His. For by one Spirit we all baptized in the one body, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Without the Holy Spirit of God, there is no born again. There's no new birth. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus said in John chapter number 3, The Spirit moved, the wind moveth, where it listeth, and, where it, and, and, and you hear the sound thereof, and canst not tell whether it comes, where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of the living God. All of you in this house tonight, probably good Baptist. And most of people in East Tennessee grew up under this culture. But have you ever been born of the Spirit of God? Because once you are, you will always know it, and it will never leave you, and you will be His forever, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. That's right. And that was all done by the Holy Spirit. So how in the world can somebody say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Yet they're preaching it. And, uh, and they will until the Lord comes and takes us to be with him. The new birth. The new birth. One of the, uh, one of the worst heretics that ever lived uh, teaches that Christ was born again and, and, and went to hell and was born again. He became a new, a new creature when he came out of hell. He was born again. Another one teaches that he was born again when he was resurrected. And they say that Christ was born again. I wish they would give me one scripture, just one scripture, that said he was born again. The Bible says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. But he did not need to be born again. Amen. He was the first man born of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first one born of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, virgin conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. All right. <coughs> Appreciate you listening to me tonight. I get excited when I get into some of this stuff because it opened the Bible up for me, folks. It really did. And you can always tell when the Bible begins to open up for you, start asking questions. And what do you mean? You start thinking about things you never thought about before. That's what that means. When you start asking questions, it means you're thinking. And, and the Bible will make you think. And that's a good thing. Amen. Search the scriptures, he says. In his law doth he meditate both day and night, it says in the Old Testament. Father, thank you for the little time we've had together. Bless these dear folk. Those that are watching now as it streams out, and those that will watch it later, May they, may, they, may, they, may they search their heart and their soul, and may they know without a shadow of a doubt they've been born again, born of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.